Today, what I want to do is break down your 13 signs that can help people identify that yes, you are sleeping with a narcissist. So let's start with number one. They see sex as gaining power. Narcissists have to have control. And this is to do with their ego. They have very fragile sense of self. They have very low self-esteem. They feel more comfortable being in control. And they didn't feel this way when they were being brought up. They have a lot of trauma. So actually control is very important for them because that's where they feel safe. So actually controlling you through sex and having all the power in sex is very important to them. You would think if someone is sel selfish sexually that they would just be focused on their own pleasure. But that's not necessarily the way with a narcissist. Sometimes they're very much self-focused on their own pleasure, but actually sometimes they're really focused on giving you pleasure because your orgasm is actually about them. It's not your orgasm for them to please you and for them, for you to be enjoying it and for them to be happy that you're enjoying it because that would be empathy. They're actually proud of themselves because they've managed to accomplish something. So this is about their achievement. And that's where it can kind of feel funny because once they've accomplished that, so you might be screaming in pleasure and then you're having the best time and you're like, oh my gosh, this is such an attentive partner, but then they can go very cold. And that's where you actually get a lot of distancing. And then also some narcissists are not like that at all. They're not trying to achieve in the bedroom. It's all about their pleasure. So narcissists come in all shapes and sizes. Um, but it's, <laughs> quite, yeah. it's quite, it's quite black and white though. It's, um, it's either like really good at pleasing you or actually terrible and completely neglecting your needs. They have to be in control. It's all about them mm -hmm. because actually the root of everything in the bedroom is about them feeding their own ego, them being in control. So um, so actually you're not really that important to them at all when it comes to sex, apart from you're, you're an achievement, whether it be that they've managed to get you there in the first place or they've managed to get you to orgasm and therefore it's another achievement for them. So very self-centered. At the start of the relationship or the situationship or, or whatever's happening with you and the narcissist, um, they'll try and pursue. And actually it's about conquering, conquering the person that they're trying to, um, they're trying to get. And there's going to be a, not, a lot of manipulation, a lot of like, how do I win this person over? They can be very much people pleasers because they are wounded. They feel a very fragile sense of self and therefore pleasing you and, and winning you over is really important, particularly in the early stages. And that can be very confusing for people because they think, oh my God, I've just met the most charming person. And, and then they switch. And then that's really traumatic for people because people have often emotionally bonded at this point. And actually, interestingly enough, even if it's just a four week romance, hormones have already kicked in and people have already felt bonded to the narcissist. So actually when that person then pulls away and distance themselves, the withdrawal symptoms that people experience are horrendous. Mm -hmm. And that's where it becomes very addictive. And actually it's a bit like trying to get off crack, trying to convince yourself to get away from that narcissist, because usually people are then trying to win the love back and they're having withdrawal symptoms from the attention because the narcissist has put someone on a pedestal and it's, it's very confusing. And rather than people being able to step back and think about what's really happened here, is this actually just a trauma bond and am I actually just in an addictive cycle? They often are just an autopilot of trying to get the narcissist to give them what they were originally receiving from them, the attention, the validation. And this is a two-sided story here because actually it's trauma on both sides. The people who gravitate towards narcissists are people who have deep wounds in themselves, um, probably not to the, the same extent because actually what we see with narcissists is that they probably probably have some element of brain damage because the trauma happens really early on. So we see some research has shown that there's differences in gray matter in the brain of a narcissist. And we don't tend to see that in, ter in terms of the people that they attract to. But what we do see in terms of the people that they attract to is also childhood trauma. So abuse or emotional neglect. So I think if people are drawn to narcissists, they should step back and just think about, okay, what happened in my early childhood? to lead me to be drawn to this individual. And I think it's really important to develop that kind of self-awareness of, okay, why am I drawn to this individual rather than just being like, okay, this individual is not treating me right. It's really awful. And, you know, and going into that kind of um, victim mentality, I think people need to also take responsibility for, okay, why am I drawn to this um, person, which can then at least 
leave them in a position to be like, okay, I need to look out for the signs really early on and I need to try to stay away from narcissists because I'm particularly prone to be drawn towards them. A trauma bond means that you bond deeply, particularly people who establish a trauma bond have a deep, profound emotional bond to someone who makes them feel fantastic at times. Mm -hmm. And then it's a roller coaster. They also make them feel horrendous and awful. So missing a narcissist, even when you break away from them, it's a really common thing. Actually leaving a narcissistic, as you know, leaving these relationships are very tough. Um, you know, on average, because they've come up with an average and this is probably not very accurate, but they say it can take about seven times to try and leave. So what we see with people trying to leave these relationships is they try and they try and they go back and they fail and they try. And some people actually are able to get away much faster depending on what they're willing to accept. But actually it's that addictive tendency and that trauma bond and the feeling of it being like crack and the craving for the affection and the validation that someone once um, once received is the trauma bond kicking in. And it's very much about what happened for that individual in childhood. So it's important for people to look at childhood and think, okay, where was a similar pattern playing out, even if it wasn't so obvious? Because actually some people have had very supportive parents who love them and have done so many great things for them, but their parents might be emotionally immature and therefore they dissociated at times and neglected their ch children's needs and didn't see their emotions. So actually what we see with people who go into these kind of relationships are often quite severe childhood emotional neglect and childhood emotional neglect is really invisible. It's not abuse. And actually, you know, there might be abuse for someone as well, but for some people it's so confusing because they'll say, but my parents were nice. My parents were supportive. My parents gave me everything, but actually, quite likely, it's quite likely that they didn't respond to the person's emotions. And that's why this person has gone on to then seek out patterns of sim similar patterns where actually someone will also neglect their emotions. Um, so while the relationship might look very different to what they've received in childhood, there's always a link there. Wow. And as you're breaking that down as well, it makes me really um, realize why the sex component of this discussion is so important. Because I can see that as actually being then a very strong manipulative tool that they're using to keep you to come back. Because in that moment, you you feel when you think of the word intimacy, you think of being naked with somebody else and really, you know, bearing yourself to them. And so you think I've just been intimate with them, like I've just spilled my vulnerability and here they are making me feel amazing. And so that trauma bond, like you were saying, if you were getting the neglect when you were younger, and now here is somebody that's making you feel amazing temporarily, but still making you feel amazing, it's such a powerful tool for them to be used against. Yeah, completely. And also sex is sometimes the way, the only way that some people can connect intimately. So when you say intimacy to someone, it's a really interesting word, because if you say to someone, what does intimacy mean to you? Some people will say, being naked, sexual intimacy. A lot of people will say that. Other people will say emotional intimacy and they'll say, into me see, you mm -hmm. see into me. Um, so like different people, you know, and there's a whole whole range of different types of intimacy, but a lot of people will only associate intimacy with sex. So they think you're, you're talking about sex. And when you see these um, superficial relationships or relationships where people are less developed emotionally, sex can be a way that they can be very intimate and really let themselves go with the other person. So actually some people will connect on a very deep level sexually when they're, when they're not able to connect in other ways. So they can't actually connect on an, in an emotional way. So if someone gravitates towards narcissists, then there is probably some limitations in relation to how they're able to connect emotionally with people and therefore they feel more able, more capable of connecting um, emotionally. For narcissists, sex can often be a great way, a very comfortable way of them connecting. And therefore the emotions come out in, in sex and that's where the emotional bond is often created. But actually outside of sex, there's often very little emotional bond. So there hasn't been conversations that help people feel very safe, conversations where people have felt really understood and where they get to know people and also conversations of overcoming conflict, which is a really important part of a healthy relationship. So sex is often very key for the narcissist because they know they can communicate in that way. They know ca they, can, they can connect in that way. So actually they're having some of their intimacy needs met where they're not able to do it in other ways. Oh, 
No, we're just getting started. We're only on number one. You've blown me away. <laughs> All right. So number two, they need to be idolized. Yeah, they really do need to be idolized. So narcissists are people who have fragile senses of self, fragile egos. So actually, if you can validate them and feed into their ego, fantastic. Um, it's good if you are a person of some kind of status, um, someone that they perceive as having some kind of status. So they'll either perceive you as very attractive, um, so physically very attractive, or that you know the right social circle, or you have the right contact, contacts, or that you have achieved academically or in your career, or you're, you're something that they are not. So then early on, they will pick you as being okay, that person's going to make me feel better about myself. So there will be a reason why you are targeted. And, um, and it's, a, it's quite a shallow reason. It's just about if I can get this person, it means I'm good enough. So they're just trying to sort out their self-esteem needs. And, um, and that's a very deep need in them. If they go into auto, autopilot, you will literally, if you're at a party and the narcissist has targeted you, they will follow you around. They will like, discreetly or less discreetly depending on how good they are but they will literally have full laser focus on you they will even if they're talking to other people they will see where you are and they will seek you out and they will be doing lots of manipulative things so that they can again conquer you and um and this makes them feel really good and it makes them feel worthy i am so glad that you said that and i'm glad for this reason i don't know about you but i hear so many women that feel like they aren't any good. And that's why they ended up with a narcissist, that they don't have any value. And that's why they ended up being chosen. But it's actually in everything that you're saying is the complete opposite. In the beginning, they will idolize you and they will perceive you. They absolutely have to perceive you as being better than them um, because you're you're a challenge or you're someone to conquer. And they're not going to choose you if they think that you're not worthy at all. This is where actually, if you go on a date with a narcissist and they've already decided, you know, that you're not good enough, you'll get this, this look. And the look is like a devaluing look. So they'll devalue you straight away. So they'll, uh, you'll walk into the day, you'll sit down, they'll sit down, maybe you've met online, and they're expecting, you know, something different. And then in their eyes, you'll just see this, like, very dismissive, like, you are not good enough for me look. And, um, and actually, I think it's a lot of people will will see this, and they'll feel this. Um, and different people will respond differently to it. Some people you know, who are looking for a very healthy partnership will just be like, that is, that's just rude. <laughs> <laughs> like, they will wrap up the date and be like, love to meet you, goodbye, and never contact them again. Someone with low self-esteem might actually feel that they need to prove their worth and they might then chase the narcissist. Mm. And, then, and then actually that person could end up in some kind of cycle with the narcissist because they're trying to prove that they're worthy. Um, of being with this person who has looked down on them and who has um, this kind of grandiose idea of self and has already decided that you're not worthy. So it's interesting what happens. Uh, you're not going to get that look if they want to conquer you and they've already perceived you as being higher status. So there's a whole status game that goes on with the narcissist. So you're either you're either on a pedestal, which is usually what happens at the start, or you're discarded straight away. But it's it's very much about how valuable are you to them. Wow. And then I assume that then leading into the bedroom, it's that that also comes with the conquering is that when they conquer you and they have really pleased you in bed, you're now in awe of them even more. And so that's where they feel the idolization. Yeah. So it might be that actually they really have had to chase you and you weren't that interested. So it might, you know, depending on the, the dynamic between the two of you, they might have had to work pretty hard. And then actually, because they have worked pretty hard, you kind of start to fall for it. You know, who doesn't want to be, you know, told they're wonderful and all these like all these lovely things. So actually, a lot of people, when they start dating a narcissist, they often have this feeling of where have you been all my life? where has this person been all my life? Oh my God, finally someone who's so open, who's, you know, so lovely and kind and um, all of these great things because often narcissists are, are charismatic. Um, they really need to prove themselves socially. So they build them up, build themselves up to be very, very charismatic. Um, so the beginning of the relationship is, is fantastic. It's like a fairy tale. And then, and then they don't want you anymore, which is devastating because it's so confusing. How can someone just drop you? You haven't done anything wrong at all. And that could be, you could be dropped over, over anything, but usually it's when you start to reciprocate. 
Right. So how do you know in those moments? Because I always like to play devil's advocate and be like, well, sometimes there's really good men out there and there's really good partners out there. And so how do you differentiate in those moments with just like someone, if you have low self-esteem, when someone says something nice to you, it feels good. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're a narcissist that's looking to be idolized. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the intensity, mm. it's going to feel mm. very intense with narcissists and there's going to be a lot going on. It's going to be intense emotions. You get swept up in this kind of fairy tale of like something happening at 90 miles an hour. It's very, very fast. A healthy relationship is going to start in a much slower, healthier way. It might be boring for someone who is used to going into quite highly um, dramatic relationships. So actually it can be quite hard for people to transition into healthier relationships because it can often feel very boring for them. But look out for the intensity because that's a sign that actually there's something going on here that's about people's self-esteem. And that's something to look mm. out for because that's an indicator of trauma. And so would you advise in those situations, let's say you have the intensity, you don't necessarily want to judge them yet. You don't want to necessarily label them immediately. Um, would you advise someone to then maybe communicate, hey, I really like you, but let's maybe slow down and then see how they react to that? Yeah, absolutely. Just just slow everything right down. And a respectful person, an empathic person mm -hmm. is going to respect that. Um, too many messages too soon. I would, I, what I always say to people is just don't do any texting at all at the start of a dating oh. scenario. So you connect with someone. Yes, you probably have to send a few messages just to kind of filter and see, has the person any banter? You know, <laughs> do you want to actually meet the person? But then jump on a phone call and then, and then speak to them on the phone. And then once you get off the phone, step back and ask yourself, how did that person make me feel? Was it good? Was it bad? You know, just check in on yourself emotionally, do body scan. What do you feel in your stomach? Because actually a narcissist will trigger emotions in you. Could be very mm -hmm. positive emotions, could be some negative ones, but just make some notes on that. Write down how you felt. Um, if it's a bit of a roller coaster and it's quite intense and you're feeling a lot of emotions, then there's something funny going on. So even if you write down, this feels so amazing. I like this person so much. That should be like a bit of a flag for you. I mean, the thing is that it's very exciting to meet yeah. someone new who you're compatible with. So I'm not saying that healthy relationships are boring and not exciting. <laughs> right. right? And that's the one you should be in. <laughs> yeah, but it's just going to be, what you're reporting is going to be a bit more normal. So actually a mm. good way of judging this is speak to your friends about this new person and then Listen to how you came across. So just reflect on the words that you said. And also sometimes the responses from other people give you clues as to are you going into a bit of a delusional you know, fantasy of who this person is or actually are you being quite realistic? Um, so how you speak to your friends about this person if they're just a nice person is going to be, yeah, they were lovely. We, we had a lot of common. It was really fun. Yeah, we kissed. We had some chemistry. I'm just going to see how it goes. You know, just normal, normal conversation. If you have met a narcissist, you're going to be like, I think it's the one. Oh my God, there's so much chemistry. The sex is fantastic. He's messaging me all the time. We just can't stop talking. We spent three hours on the phone the other night. And there's like, you sound a bit obsessive. You know, there's something obsessive going on in you, which is why I like to take the blame off the narcissist because I think that a lot of people are focusing on how bad narcissists are and there's this overuse of the term. A lot of people are just calling people narcissists even, even when they don't meet the full diagnostic criteria of NPD. So actually, I think people need to first of all recognize that narcissists um, have huge trauma within themselves and there's a lot of shame there and, and that's why they are the, the way that they are. But actually, I think it's really important for people to see the trauma within themselves and actually think about when are they going into these obsessive cycles where they're idolizing the narcissist as much as the narcissist is idolizing them. So what happens, because I'm going to picture my audience right now feeling a little like victimized or like it, blame that it's them choosing, which I, I understand what you're saying, but let's actually, if you don't mind going a little deeper here. When you have empathy for somebody, right? I think it, that is beautiful. That can be, is a really important part of the human be, be, being. Yeah. I love that. The problem is what happens if you do start to show empathy to narcissists? Isn't that then just almost giving them a, either the power back or letting them off the hook. This is a really important point here because actually let's talk about the dynamic and who 
who attracts to narcissists. So the people who attract to narcissists are very sensitive souls. So they're emotionally very sensitive people and often empaths. Um, but the childhood trauma that they have experienced is somewhat similar to what the narcissist has experienced. And that's where this extremely hot dynamic comes into it. So people are drawn to narcissists because there's something familiar going on. On a subconscious level, they are resonating with one another. They have experienced very similar childhood trauma because the narcissist is less, far less susceptible to change. Perhaps their trauma has happened earlier and they're less likely to change. Um, it's, it's very unlikely for a narcissist to change. So the empath, probably less trauma, uh, far more willing to reflect on their behaviors, far more willing to see actually two-sided um, parts of the story, far more willing to go to therapy, far more willing to change, far more willing to be compassionate. Um, so we've got kind of the, we've got kind of like, like for like is attracting, but also opposites are attracting. So I don't want to sound like I'm blaming the person who goes for the narcissist at all, but actually some level of un self understanding and just being able to reflect on your history, your past, what, what might have happened is just really helpful because then you can actually kind of, um, first of all, have empathy for yourself. And it's not your fault that actually you end up um, going for a narcissist because you haven't had the best cards dealt to you. You've had some stuff happen early in life that was incredibly difficult and therefore you've got, you've got deep trauma. Um, that you need to work on. And then also, it's really important to have empathy for the narcissist as well. And this is something that's almost never talked about. And I like to talk about it because actually, I like to highlight how much they suffer. And they don't really tend to do a very good job of being able to explain that to people because there's so much shame. So you rarely get to understand how much a narcissist is actually suffering on a daily basis. They hide it very well, but it is actually happening. So you've got two people. And so you're, you know, bringing your trauma into this relationship or this dating situation. They're bringing their trauma and they're really suffering. They're suffering so much that actually they can't really respond to your emotions very well. Um, so it's not really their fault either. And I think it's important that you actually have that empathy, but then keep your distance because they're not going to change and you really need to be realistic about it. Um, but actually, I think it's really good for people to kind of see both sides of the story and just understand the dynamic and understand why have you and this other person attracted in the first place. Now, you don't need to try and explain this to the narcissist. That's not going to help them change right. um, because some people would think, OK, but maybe if I just empathize more. Um, and actually, that's a huge problem is, is that the people who are attracted to narcissists have so much empathy that they end up putting up with way too much in these relationships. So. So you are an empath if you end up going for a narcissist, typically. One of the biggest fallacies is that relationships shouldn't be work. Say what? what? We put time, effort and hard work into growing our careers or our business, but love should just happen? After 20 years of being married, all stars were being willing to ask and answer hard questions. I have a free downloadable PDF for you for a happy, successful, lasting love. Click the link below for free access to the most important questions you must ask your partner PDF. So when people are in this day and age saying the word narcissist, what they really mean is low empathy and self-centered. And that low empathy and self-centeredness is just coming from not being able to mature properly because they didn't have the right support when they were children. And that's not, that's not their fault. Everyone was highly narcissistic when they were children. You know, it's part of growing up. We, we later develop our empathy and we later develop the ability to actually, you know, see other people's perspectives. And, um, which is why kids don't necessarily care if their parents are tired. They just want to be fed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, so the narcissist, they just, you grew up and you grew past them and, and they didn't, they didn't have that capacity in them. Um, some research, as I mentioned before, suggests that their brains were damaged actually from the trauma that they experienced. And, and that's why they they can't really empathize or see things from other people's perspective. And it's also why they tend to have addictions as well. So actually a part of the, the way that gray matter is in their brain means that it actually feeds into not being able to, um, to regulate in a way where they can stay away from addictive behaviors or substances and just have the compassion to know that actually this is just 
from trauma and um, and they've really suffered. Ooh, um, God, this is really tough, and but I, we need to keep talking about it. it. How can you have compassion for someone, though, if they've been absolutely abusive to you? Because yeah. I've been with somebody who is verbally abusive, but I was young. I was out of it fairly quickly. But when if you've been, if you've had kids, you've been with them for 20 years, they verbally abused you, they've threatened you, they've maybe physically abused you. Um, I can't want to just stick up the finger, the middle finger to them and not yeah. have em- any empathy for them. Yeah, you can do that too. That's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. This is a great, great question. So first of all, if you get out really soon, then it's not about you. It's about them. And you can be far away from them and be like, that's awful that they suffered that much right, in yeah. early life and they're still suffering on a daily basis and that they weren't able to treat you correctly, but you got out and therefore you can be far away having compassion because you didn't get too deep into it. If you're deeply traumatized and you've been in a relationship for 40 years with a narcissist and you get out, just focus on you. You don't need to have any compassion for them at all. You know, they've probably done too much damage for you to be able to get there. If you ever get to the point of forgiveness, then that's great too. You know, that just shows that actually you've done a lot of work and you've reached the acceptance stage of accepting that you were in an absolutely horrendous situation and that you've gotten out and you've gotten to this place of actually being able to forgive them. That's an amazing place to get to, but it's not somewhere to aspire to Mm -hmm. at all. Some people get there. It's not, you know, as a therapist, I'm never going to be saying to someone, you need to forgive your abusive ex-partner. Like that's just not a goal that I would try and encourage anyone to set. But if someone manages to get there because maybe not enough damage has been done and they got out very early, you know, then they can kind of realize or you don't even have to have compassion. You you know, just for you to understand that they've suffered kind of gives you a bit of an explanation. But be careful with that one because a lot of people who are with narcissists then want to give more empathy to them. And they're like, right. oh, but they've suffered. I'll just care for them even more. And then I tell them, I'll tell them how much I understand that they have suffered. And then maybe they'll be like, oh, she understands me. I'll, I'll stay with them. But actually don't let it be a reason to um, give them more love and give them more power, more power over you. Yeah. So number three, they are right and you are always wrong. This is a hard one because this is where gaslighting comes into it. And it could be you know, just it could be minor things where it'll happen in the early stages after the idolization um, stage or could even happen during the idolization stage. But there's going to be some subtle ways of them basically telling telling you that they're right and and you're wrong. Um, They can't accept actually that they're wrong. And this is kind of um, a psychosis that kicks in where they actually start believing their own delusions and they have to be able to buy into them being right because that protects their ego. So it is a little bit delusional and some people find it really hard to understand how much they lie, but actually they seem to believe their own lies. They seem to be able to convince themselves that their reality is the reality. Mm-hmm. And that's why they are often able to tell you that you're you're um, wrong and, and that helps them feel in control. And you can't convince them otherwise, right? I mean, it's just not worth really having that conversation. Um, if you feel like you managed to convince them otherwise, it's probably they've probably agreed with you to get what they want. So right. there's so much manipulation going on. It's just better, you know, it's easier early on to just, you know, try to have the reasonable conversation. And when you see that that reasonable conversation is not going in the way that you need it to, you know, it's not going in a two-way conversation because they're just sticking to their reality, then it's good to distance yourself at that point. But if you're, if you've had years of being gaslit, then that's where you start to think you're crazy at times because they're trying to, they're so persuasive that their version of reality is accurate. Mm. I'd actually completely forgotten where the word gaslighting came from. Do you mind explaining it? Yeah, so gaslighting came from basically this man who was trying to convince, I don't know if it was his wife, but his wife that, uh, let's just say his wife, that she was going crazy. So he kept turning down the gaslight and then she, you know, would see the light being dimmed and and it was, she would question her reality and, and he kept doing that to kind of help her feel like she was going a bit mad. And then that's where gaslighting came from because actually you feel like you're going a bit mad when someone tries to gaslight you. Yeah, God, I've completely forgotten. And hearing you explain it again, I was like, oh, it's such an interesting way of really manipulating someone, right? Making you think it's about you and that you're going crazy. And so with this this sign of, you know, that that you can never be right because 
they always have to have to be right um, really then explains the gaslighting technique that they're going to use on you because they have to make sure that you don't ever question them and that you question yourself instead absolutely and because you don't behave in this way you will want to consider their perspective because you have the ability to consider their perspective and they don't have the ability to consider other people's perspectives. So when they say, let's just say you were in a cab and they were very rude to the cab driver and you get out of the cab and you say, do you mind if we just have a quick chat about what happened in the cab? Um, I felt a bit uncomfortable, like the cab driver was trying to make some small talk and you just cut them off and you just started talking to me and it was very, you know, I felt it was a little bit rude. You know, can we please, can you please be more polite? Um, they will be like, what are you talking about? That never happened. I didn't turn to you. I, di I didn't cut them off. No, I was listening. And it would literally be like, Delusional stuff that never happened, but they'll be so persuasive. And the reason you'll think for a second, wait, are they right? Did I get, you know, was I mistaken? Is because actually you're very good at considering other people's perspective. And, uh, and also you wouldn't do this. You would, it's not in your nature to start making up lies about particularly small mm. situations. Of course, sometimes it can be big situations. So therefore you'll spend a moment to be like, oh, wait, are they, is, is their version of reality actually accurate? And am, am I am I missing something? So you'll, you'll reflect on these situations and question yourself because actually you're into having two-way conversations. So you want to see your perspective and you want to consider the other person's perspective. Narcissists are not able to do that. And in conflict, it will always be about them. That's literally what I was going to ask you about the perspective thing, because sometimes... You just have a different perspective to than someone else, right? What may be rude to one person isn't rude to another. So... Um, so the idea of the gaslighting is when they ha they can't even acknowledge your perspective on that situation. I mean, it's just bizarre lies sometimes that, yeah, they cannot acknowledge your perspective, but it appears that they are convincing themselves of a new reality. And that's where it seems to be a bit delusional that actually they they are experiencing a kind of psychosis, a kind of very, very minor psychosis in these in these modes because they are believing their own reality. And that's why they're so convincing when they're gaslighting you. It's not just about manipulation. It's not this conscious thought that they have where I'm like, I'm going to convince her. I'm going to tell some lies to persuade her. Mm -hmm. It appears to actually be far more delusional than that and that to protect their ego instantly they believe their own reality. And um, and that's why gaslighting is so persuasive and makes you question yourself so much. Mm. Yeah, because as you even just um, given the example of the cab, I was thinking about when I first met my husband and he met my family. I come from a very loud Greek family. And so he meets them and I think, oh, they love him. He loves them. We leave. And my husband's like, they're so rude. And I was like, what? How did you perceive them as rude? He's like, they cut me off when I talk. They don't even listen. I'm like, oh, no, that's just how the Greeks are. Right. And so like, as you were describing, I was like, oh, but we were open to hearing each other's thoughts and ideas. It wasn't like, what do you mean? And we didn't, didn't like dismiss each other. Is that like the, the, yeah. the fine difference? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is where the when you have your first conflict with the narcissist, it's not going to be mm. not going to be productive because actually conflict is very healthy in relationships. The first interesting test of a relationship is conflict. And actually, how is that person going to be with your emotions, with your opinions, with your perspectives? How is that going to pan out? And it's not going to be comfortable with the narcissist. They are going to have to win. All right. Number four, they believe they know you more than you know yourself. Oh, this one hit me hard. And I believe even to go into detail, you said what you are, what you think and what you believe. Mm -hmm. They just start telling you things about yourself and that's to feel better about themselves and to, to put you down. And so they have control because they have to have the power here. They have to be the better one. They have to feel like they're the better one. So they might say, oh, Lisa, um, you know, you've like really, you're really experimenting with your style, aren't you? And I was like, <laughs> and you're like, you're like, no, I love my style. I know my style really well. What the hell is this person talking about? But imagine if you have low self-esteem, you will be like, oh, maybe they maybe they know better because they can say it with a really nice tone. So it'd be like, oh, maybe they are going to be my guide. Mm. Maybe they're going to guide me. So I'm, I feel, you know, so I am a better version of myself. And um, when they start to do this, you're either going to take it or you're not going to take it. Um, so you're, you're either going to be someone who's like, well, no, I'm very happy with my style. I'm very com comfortable with it. You know, I've established this over time. I, I feel great about it. And they're not going to like that at all because then 
they realize actually they can't control you or else you're going to be really submissive and you're not going to have the confidence to actually see what's going on. And you're going to be like, okay, like, well, what do you think I should wear? What do you think I, you know, how do you think I should dress? Or, or you might not say that you might just come out in something a bit different the next time and hope for their approval. So there might be like subtle changes in your behavior because you're terrified of being criticized by them, you know, depending on where your self-esteem is at. So, so actually they'll do this, I know better than you know yourself and telling you what you are in order for you to, um, it's kind of a way to belittle you really to, to, so they have the control again. Is that what then happens maybe slowly over time where they maybe make a comment about what you're wearing and it's not a big enough comment. It's not like a big argument. Maybe you go like, maybe I am wearing something a little revealing. And so you next time you wear something that's a little less revealing. And then by the time you know it, you have a year, two years, three years of this, you can no longer recognize yourself. Yeah. I think that's that's a very typical pattern, particularly when people fall into long term relationships. It kind of, you know, it kind of gradually like eats away at mm. you. And I mean, it's awful. People lose their sense of self. It can happen really quickly, though, as well. Um, you know, people get very deep in these relationships, you know, within a month. People are like are, are often hooked. And there's often a lot of fear um, of abandonment, actually, on both sides. So both people are terrified of being abandoned and they do ridiculous things in order to not be left. Um, so actually the person who's gone for the narcissist will accommodate the behavior, the wants, the needs, and yes, start to dress differently, talk differently, do a lot of different things in order to try and stay in the relationship um, because they're terrified of being abandoned when actually they should be running from the relationship. Yeah. So how do you know in those moments, because you actually said, uh, I'd like to go a little deeper on this one, Maybe someone's giving you advice or maybe someone, right, is like, well, maybe they're right. And maybe someone's trying to advise you in a healthy way. Where's that difference between someone trying to advise you in a healthy way versus someone's trying to control you and manipulate you? Yeah, that's a really good question. First of all, if someone is trying to, you know, just offer you some advice, usually it comes from a place of love or care and there's room for that two-way conversation. So if someone is being a bit like, dominant in, in saying, oh, you know, what about this dress or like, what about this outfit? And they're, you know, they're taking it a bit too far. You know, if you say to this person, look, I appreciate you're trying to help me, but I don't really need any guidance on my dress sense. They will just accept it and they'll just be like, oh, okay, sorry, I was just trying to help. And then that's it. Mm -hmm. But actually the narcissist is not going to take kindly to losing control. So they're going to, you know, maybe be passive aggressive, like be a bit annoyed and not actually take your feedback about how their behavior has impacted you very well at all. Oh, yeah, that's great. And so the passive aggressiveness, how would that pot potentially look? The passive aggressiveness is just like, again, looks of disapproval, uh, ghosting you even, um, you know, just something that is going, you know, quite cold on you or just just not a normal, you know, not normal interaction with someone. Yeah, Whew, that's super powerful. Um, OK, number five, they won't want to communicate about sex. Mm. Yeah. They won't want to communicate about sex. <laughs> You're like, that's it. <laughs> yeah, they really won't. Well, okay. So, I mean, first of all, the sex might be amazing. You might never need to communicate about sex because for some narcissists, sex is their mastery. It is their hobby. It is their talent. They have become very accomplished in it because it makes them feel really good and it, it really boosts their ego. So you might never need to talk about sex. Sex might be perfect. And that is actually great in some ways, but it's terrible in other ways because that's what's going to keep you glued and very addicted to that relationship. It's going to be one of the things that's going to really mean that you find it quite difficult to leave. But in a relationship, if you're in a relationship with a narcissist and they're neglecting your sexual needs and it's all about them and you tell them what you like and then they do it once and then they forget or they seem like they forget. They haven't forgotten. They just don't care. So you might bring it up with them and they will probably feel quite awkward about the conversation. Um, they may or may not look awkward, but they, they're not sort of kind of interested in making you happy. They're not interested in actually having this mutual, um, mutually satisfying sexual relationship. So they're either just going to be dismissive or things won't change. It's just not going to be a productive conversation. Mm. So how do you know, though, in that situation, because I, again, love playing devil's advocate, that maybe they're just embarrassed 
or maybe they're like they feel a bit of shame where they're like oh my god I think I've, I thought I've been pleasing her this whole mm. time and I haven't yeah. and so that's what shuts them down from communicating yeah okay so that's a really good point um, sex can cause shame a lot of shame for a huge amount of people and we often as humans almost all of us have some kind of sexual trauma in some shape, shape mm. or form because actually a lot of things like genitals are ashamed from a very early age there's a lot of messages that are shameful around sex so we we all have shame related to sex, some people more so than others. So if conversations about sex feel very shameful for someone and they shut down, then if they have, if they're capable of empathy and they care about their relationship, they're going to find a way to communicate with you in some shape or form. They're not going to just completely ghost this topic where you feel incapable of being able to return to it. They'll, they'll try to communicate with you in some way, um, even if it's just text messages or, you know, or something or, or trying something different or, you know, they still want to fix things in their relationship. Whereas the narcissist, um, you've already criticized them for their performance mm -hmm. sexually. Like, don't ever do that uh, because, well, or do do that. And then you realize the relationship's not going to work and you get your, your exit. But their ego is so fragile that if they feel criticized in relation to sex, it ruins them. You will destroy them. And, and it's very, it's not a nice situation. So the behavior that you'll then see, I mean, they might just ghost you forever and you may never speak to them ever again. Like it can be that extreme, or it will just be that that topic never gets broached again. And they give you a clear signal that that's not a safe topic to, to broach with them. So um, the difference is that the extreme reaction when it comes to shame being triggered about sex it's to do with their fragile ego and, and it's really bruised their ego and it's just not safe to, to talk about this topic. And as you were talking, I was thinking maybe they would show like almost disrespect or disdain for you for bringing it up versus yeah. shame, which is, I think, quite a different uh, response. Yeah, that's actually a really good point that they will make you feel bad for bringing up the topic mm. because then you're not going to you're not going to bring it up again. And, um, and that's a, an ego defense that actually if you're the problem, they're not the problem and therefore... They haven't done anything to perform poorly <laughs> when it comes to sex because um, that would be too difficult for them to take on board that they're not perfect. Mm, yeah. Um, all right. Number six, your needs and emotions don't matter. Yeah, it's the problems with empathy. And, you know, this is what we're seeing with, as I mentioned before, the, the, the differences with grey matter that it's possible that narcissists from a young age have not developed the ability to empathize to the way that's most ideal for sustaining healthy relationships. And therefore, they are just incapable of feeling the relevant amount of empathy to be able to make your needs matter. And this doesn't mean they can't be empathic because actually they can attend to your emotions very well. Some narcissists do, but when it's about their behavior and how their behavior impacts you neg negatively, that's where their empathy gets so clouded because they need to protect their ego. They can't see anything to do with your emotions because they've been triggered. And so that just means keep shutting you down? Yeah. It means like they just cannot see your emotions. They can only see in, in those moments they feel shame. They feel embarrassment. They feel not good enough um, because you're telling them that something that they did was not good enough. Mm -hmm. And that's huge for them because that makes them feel in inadequate. It reminds them of the, the, the neglect that they experienced when they were young. They were sent messages of not feeling good enough when they were little. And, um, and that really activates huge trauma. But you're not going to hear that from them. They're not going to be able to articulate that that's what's going on, but you're going to see huge defenses when, when that happens. Wow. You've mentioned actually gray matter a few times. Do you mind actually just explaining that a little? There is some research studies that suggest that there's differences in gray matter in the narcissist compared to someone who doesn't have high traits of narcissism. And also this is just some research. So, you know, we actually need a lot more research, a lot more brain scans for a narcissist to actually see, you know, what are the differences. But there is some differences that you can see on brain scans where you're like, okay, this is interesting. There are some parts of the brain that are related to addictive behavior and capacity for empathy that are different in narcissist compared to um, non-narcissists.
That's not to say that people can't change. People are incredibly capable of capacity for change. And the brain is very neuroplastic and we can really rewire the brain if we're motivated to do so. The problem with narcissists is they're often not motivated to actually change. It's too difficult for them, causes too much shame. They don't respect authoritative figures enough to be able to confide in them and feel safe. So they get the right support and guidance in order to change. We tend to only see narcissists in therapy when their relationship break down, breaks down. That's tends to be the only sign, only time that they turn up for, for therapy um, because they don't really want to seek guidance from any from other people. People who are on the opposite side, who gravitate towards relationships with narcissists are far more capable of change, um, but actually change can still also be very tough. Um, but that's not to say that they can't change what's happened in their brain in early childhood as a result of trauma. So why would a narcissist go to a therapist then if they don't ever want to admit that they're wrong or anything's wrong with them? So we tend to get phone calls from narcissists when a relationship is breaking down. So their partner has given them an ultimatum, they're threatening to leave or their partner has already, already left and they're in huge distress and they can't cope and they will do anything to bring that relationship back mm. intact because actually they're abandoned and narcissists really fear abandonment. So like if you ignore a narcissist, it's very uncomfortable for them. If they, if they have feelings for you, if they have emotional ties to you, it's going to be it's going to be difficult for them. So actually, when you leave the relationship or you give them an ultimatum, it triggers their fear of abandonment and they will turn up for therapy in order to try and get you back because they know that's the thing that will probably work. But then they tend to use therapy as a place to sometimes brag about their achievements. Um, I've had people turn up, turn up for therapy where they've bragged about all of their affairs and try and use it as a stage. Of course, I've said, look, I'm really sorry, I can't work with you because this is not this is not therapy. I'm not going to listen mm, to all of these. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to you brag about all your affairs. You know, we're either, you're either, you know, turning up, no more affairs and we're doing the work or, or we're not doing it. Yeah. Um, so actually, narcissists don't stay very long in therapy unless a therapist will entertain this, um, mm. this ego boosting that they'll do. So they might just tell these self-praising stories and they like to have a bit of an audience. And that's where some narcissists will you know, pay every week to actually be heard and feel validated. But if a therapist calls them out on their bad behavior, then they're not going to stay in therapy. Uh, or they might, yeah, kind of glide through to therapy in some shape or form, but usually they're not ready to do the real work. If people have narcissistic traits, though, and they really are motivated to change, that's very different from narcissistic personality disorder. So they are you know, people with narcissistic traits are capable of change because actually we all have narcissistic traits. It is in all of us, but actually when people are damaged, those narcissistic traits are, you know, far greater than what is healthy. So it's not that they're looking to go to therapy to actually change. It's to either get an audience or show their ex that they're faux changing. Exactly. Got it. Whew, it's so complicated. <laughs> it's like, well, he's gone to therapy. Look, see, he really wants to make this work. Oh, yeah, exactly. Which is the manipulation in a way. I mean, because it's, it's highly manipulative to kind of, you know, pretend you're going to do the work. And, you know, and sometimes things are consciously manipulative with narcissists. Sometimes things are just, you know, autopilot of like, OK, well, she says go to therapy, she'll stay with me. I'll go to therapy, she'll mm -hmm. stay with me. And, you know, they're often not thinking about things on a, you know, a deep level because they're not able to really consider your perspective um, because actually if they were able to consider your perspective, lies would feel terrible. They would feel very guilty about lying. They'd feel guilty about cheating, but actually because they're not able to consider your perspective, then that guilt doesn't kick in in a way that guides them. So how do you know then in that moment that let's say you, you have a turbulent relationship, you've gone through all the signs that we're going through and you bring it up to your narcissistic partner, maybe you leave them and then they're like, oh, look, I'll, I'll go to therapy. How do you know then, because obviously you can't sit on that therapy session, that it's actually authentic? Yeah, so one of the biggest problems with people who have been in relationships for a long time with narcissists is they are convinced that the narcissist will change. And they also have a bit of a fixing compulsion, which is usually about trying to fix the parent mm. who has um, had the mental health difficulties or has had something that's not been ideal where they've suffered in, in childhood and they just really needed to fix their parent. So they play out this fixing compulsion with their partner. Um, so then the, the wishful thinking of maybe they'll change one day 
people hold on to that because they want the love back. They want the good times back and they often experience those good times. And that's where you see people stay in these relationships for 40 years and, um, and they're constantly, you know, chasing the maybe they will change. Um, so I think this is about actually seeking very good advice, having very good support, actually confiding in your friends and telling them what's really going on. Because for some people, when they're in these relationships, they hold so much shame that they don't want to say to their friends how bad it really is. Um, so actually trying to be realistic about how much change is possible is important. And sometimes people don't know if their partner is a narcissist or not. They're kind of like, oh, they, you know, maybe a narcissist, maybe not a narcissist. And then they kind of do a lot of overthinking about it and they do a lot of ruminating about the change and kind of it becomes almost like a fantasy or a daydream like they are preoccupied and consumed by this idea of change or else completely sweeping it all under the carpet and just getting through life and just life is just about survival rather than actually really thriving. I've worked with women who have accepted all sorts of things in relationships and, you know, they'll accept like raised voices, for instance, um, which I see that as a, a huge boundary crossing, but often because boundaries are crossed to such extremes and there's so much name calling and there's so much horrendous behavior in some of these relationships that the boundaries, you know, the bar is so low. So actually there's a lot of mistreatment going mm. on. So I would say write a list of all the boundaries that you absolutely will not accept. Um, and, you know, even the smallest of things, and then actually see what's it like to try and communicate those boundaries to your partner. Does your partner respect them? Because they understand that actually their behavior does make you, you know, feel bad when they do these certain things that you are saying cross your boundaries. And then they should respect that if they have you know, an adequate amount of empathy. But if you're taking this list to your partner and you're saying, look, I feel these things are, you know, it's crossing my boundaries when you shout at me, it's crossing my boundaries when you call me names, um, you know, it's crossing your boundaries when you, you know, when we have fights in front of our children. Uh, so you're, you're starting to list these things and then all of the crazy kind of conversation takes place. They're denying it or, you know, it's just not a two-way conversation. Then that's probably a good indicator to leave. At that oh, point. that's very tactical. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Number seven, well, they'll make you believe there is something wrong with you. Yeah. So, well, this is a control thing and also it's protecting their ego because if you're the problem, then they're good. Mm -hmm. And that you, you need the fixing. So you're the one with the problem. And some people take that on in quite a codependent way. So then actually they become kind of like the mentor and you become almost like the patient. And, um, and then they, they have control over the relationship. And, and if you follow that lead, you can sustain the relationship. They can stay in that relationship because their ego is intact and you can stay in that relationship because you're following their lead and that can go on for a really long time but you have to accept that there's something wrong with you even though there's nothing wrong with you mm -hmm. uh, and you know of course it's a two-way relationship we all have our flaws um so if your relationship looks very much like you know patient uh, you're the patient and they're not mm -hmm. they're the leader then they're saying there's something wrong with you and and that's how the relationship can be sustained for a very long time but it's not healthy and then speaking of the flaws they'll probably deny they have any and then be very um, open and uh, encouraging to point out your flaws. Yeah, exactly. Because they can't accept that they're less than perfect. It causes too much shame in them. It really triggers the I'm not good enough and the core beliefs in them, the negative core beliefs. And that, that really feels uncomfortable. So they will do anything to protect their ego. Um, so you can't tell them that their behavior was not appropriate. They're going to be defensive. Mm hmm. Very fair. Okay. Number eight, you'll get devalued, ghosted and ignored. Yeah. The devaluing phase of the narcissistic relationship, it's horrendous because you've been idolized, you've been put on a pedestal, you've been wooed, you've been told you're fabulous. You feel like this absolute high and all of a sudden you're nothing. You are not important anymore and they're gone and they are a different person. And actually the person that you thought existed never existed in the first place. That was just the pursuing phase. That was Casanova. Mm. Casanova is not who you want to be in a relationship with. Yes, they'll bring you flowers and knock on your door and hunt you down and, you know, woo you in, in the way that the movies show you that love is supposed to be like, but actually it's not very healthy at all because um, if something is too good to be true or too intense at the start, you're going to get the flip side. So you, the idolization comes first and then the devaluation, which is where you're going to get disgusted, you're going to get d ghosted and discarded. Ooh. Oh, yeah. When you said that, like, they change, it's not actually that they change, it's that they are now showing you who they really are. 
Yeah, yeah. they don't change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they don't change. They just get bored because actually you're no longer feeding their ego because you've fallen for them. And if you've fallen for them, then you're not good enough. So then that means that you're not good enough for them because they can only be with someone who's incredible, who's amazing, uh, because then they feel good enough. So they have to go on to their next victim. They have to well, chase them. So what if they don't move on though? How does that devaluation look like maybe like in a marriage on a day to day? Yeah, because they don't, I mean, you're lucky if they move on. If they ghost you and you oh, never, yeah. and they, they've devalued you forever permanently, you know, obviously it's very painful, but you've dodged a huge bullet. Often they don't move on because often they won't move on until they found their next they have to feel, you know, usually they'll have back to back relationships. So they'll already be having an affair and then they might jump into that. They oh. might jump ship. So a lot of back, back to back uh, relationships go on with narcissists. But um, so they might hold on to you because actually you, you know, you are someone that they can control. Um, they have, you know, what they, they have their needs met um, and, you know, they have reasons why they're staying, but they've already devalued you. So the devaluing stage is then mistreating you and putting you down and making you not feel good and not responding to your emotions. And then um, the cycle starts all over again, because actually you might distance yourself and you might ignore them and you might might do things where actually they need to wear you back again. Mm -hmm. And then that's where you have a cycle of a lot of idolization and devaluing. And will they flip flop? So like if you're about to leave or you're showing signs of like, um, like almost recognition, like, hang on a minute, this person isn't like, will they start to then go, will they flip back to the putting you on a pedestal? Well, in these relationships, we often see break up, get back together. Right, you know, so, yeah. it's a, so to get you back, they will often have to do the idolization again and, and chase you and conquer. And then in those stages, if you have distanced yourself and you have been like, no, actually, the, my partner's done something really inappropriate. I need some space. They you know, start to question, oh, maybe you were good enough. And then they start to idolize you again. Mm. And, oh, if she's strong enough to leave me or strong enough to ignore me, maybe she is good enough. I need to prove to myself that I'm worthy. So therefore I'm going to chase her back again. So actually it depends on your behavior. And this is, you know, this is interesting because it's, it's not completely just all in their control. How you respond to them will often influence how the cycle goes. So actually, if you are someone who distances yourself and you're, you're someone who kind of like doesn't speak to them for a while when they participate in bad behaviors, then you're going to probably see some kind of idolization again. If you're someone who just consistently chases them, you're more likely to get devalued and dropped and ghosted or just, you know, or else they'll stay in the relationship and, um, you know, just kind of drag you along because they're also not very good at breaking up with people um, because, they're, they're people pleasers. So they're not going to sit you down and say, look, you know, we've had a fabulous time, but we're just not very aligned. I just don't think this relationship is going to continue. But, you know, I really, really, I really love the time that I've had with you. That's not going to be a breakup conversation with a narcissist. They will often avoid breaking up with you because actually it's, it's conflict. So avoidance of conflict is huge. Um, so actually dragging a relationship on for an incredibly long time is not uncommon for a narcissist. This is something they will often do and they'll just keep the relationship going rather than leaning into what they're really feeling and trying to make decisions based on that. Mm. And in the devaluing process then, for some people, I assume you're going to try harder. And so is that like a way for them to even feel better about themselves? Because like now you're really trying hard. It's like, well, I must be great if this person's trying hard to keep me. Yeah, it becomes a, a game. And actually you know, with some narcissists where they're going more into having some traits of, of, psycho, of, of being a psychopath that actually they might experience pleasure in your suffering. So if you're chasing them and you're sending them loads of messages, please, please talk to me. You know, can we just have a conversation? I don't understand what's happened, like what's gone wrong. They may be reading those messages and actually feeling a lot of pleasure in your suffering if they have some traits of being a psychopath. I'm not saying all narcissists will actually feel pleasure out of your suffering but some will so will narcissists more like feel numb but psychopaths will feel excitement well some people have traits of being a psychopath and also there will be very high traits of narcissism there as well so there's a crossover you know it's a spectrum mm, like everything right, is a spectrum yeah. right you have you know your normal person has actually lots of traits of narcissism and those can be quite helpful. We just like taking selfies, getting in front of the camera, exactly, things like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly what we're doing right now. Yeah. You know, you get things done. It motivates you. Yeah. You know, we, we need a little bit and um, you know, it's how people write books. Um, so, so then you've got like the healthy population. Yes. Some traits of narcissism and then we move up and then you've got 
people who have loads of traits of narcissism, not psychopaths. So they're not so manipulative mm -hmm. or they can rein themselves in. So they're not causing so much harm. They're not saying abusive things. They're able to somewhat control their behavior, but they'll still play out the uh, the chasing behavior, the conquering behavior, the devaluing, the de but it might be done in a more passive, more covert kind of way. That's where you're going to see the covert narcissist. Then we start leaning into the psychopath, which is actually, again, very, very high traits of narcissism, even far more than the previous, previous part of the spectrum. And then you're seeing the actual psychopathic behavior is very high manipulation. And that's where things get quite dangerous. Oh, really? Yeah, I was actually going to ask, um, I don't want to derail, but like, what are the little signs difference between then the, the narcissist and the psychopath? Psychopath, I think that most people will be left feeling on edge most of the time. So this is when your body is going to give you messages. So even if you're not very good at regulating your own emotions, what you will still feel is anxiety because we can't suppress anxiety. That's the one emotion that we feel, you know, regardless, mm -hmm. it will come up if it needs to come up. And often what happens when you're in a relationship or you're interacting with a narcissist who has some traits of being a psychopath is your body is actually going into fight or flight and telling you to run, even when you're not seeing that the behaviors are problematic. But there's something going on in the interaction that your survival system is kicking in and you're going into fight or flight state. state. So what you might notice, let's just say you go on a first date with a narcissist who is also leaning into being a psychopath, you're going to very, be feel very, very nervous on that date. And it'll be more than just first date nerves. You'll be very self-conscious and you'll feel it in your body. And it will um, be very much about that other person's gaze. It's like that other person's gaze is on you and you're their puppet and they want to really have you on their strings. And your body is saying, you know, get away, run, but actually you're not cognitive. So you're not thinking, oh wait, this person is being manipulative. There's something dangerous. I need to get away. But your body is telling you. And what happens here is that often people will then wake up in night terrors. They'll have panic attacks in their sleep. They'll feel, feel very anxious going to work and their body just absorbs um, the anxiety. And that's if they're being highly manipulated in a relationship, their body is, is actually telling the signs of there's something seriously wrong, fight or flight, go. But the person's not able to recognize that it's fight or flight and it's their body saying go. And in a lot of people, actually, if that anxiety is, let's just say a bit less, um, they will perceive that ex as excitement and that's what's, what will get them going. And that's what they will perceive as attraction. But actually it's not attraction, it's fear. And this is where people often confuse fear and attraction. And they go for these more dramatic relationships because they need the anxiety to kick in. They need to feel that excitement. But actually what it really is, is it's fear. They know their body is preempting that they're going to get hurt. They're preempting something is going to go, go wrong. But actually they're, uh, they're really used to relationships where actually they feel a lot of excitement or they feel a lot of, a lot of anxiety. They don't know any different. And this is where actually they've had to, this individual most likely has felt very on edge in their household growing up, that there was, there was stuff going on that made them feel uncomfortable. And then that becomes normalized. So then when people are feeling that in dating scenarios or in relation, in the early stages of relationships, they're not recognizing that it's a fight or flight thing. And they're actually thinking, oh no, this is the excitement of love. It's not, it's, oh. it's anxiety. Well, because your body is responding in that same way. You get, may get the sweaty palms, you get the, like the racing heart. So your body can perceive, right? Fear, anxiety, and uh, attraction is somewhat the same. Yeah. And also there's a self-esteem element because if someone is experiencing social anxiety essentially you know because it's the gaze of the narcissist and you're wanting to impress this you know charismatic person the person usually thinks there's something wrong with them if they're having the heart palpitations and they think it's something wrong with their confidence and then they will actually label it more as a problem with their social anxiety mm. rather than it be being actually that their body is doing them a huge favor and saying run mm -hmm. uh, so this is where people often will be like oh but I just feel so nervous on you know I, I'm going on the second date with a narcissist of course they're not they're not using them that that, that label but um that I've gone on the second date and I just oh, I'm like a bundle of nerves I'll drink some alcohol before I go, or I'll drink on the date to settle the nerves. And what you're doing is you're actually shutting off your anxiety system and you need your anxiety system to help you get out of the relationship in the early days. 
Ooh. So um, I find this stuff fascinating. I um, actually at one point was really fascinated with Ted Bundy and just like how he was able to use so much charisma. I obviously didn't know about narcissism and things like that back then. But like you would see these videos of him and like he would seem so charming and like you're like, oh, my God, of course. And then you see another video of him and you see like dead in his eyes and like he doesn't see like he sees through your soul. So when you were describing like the narcissist and the psychopath where it's like that fight or flight where you're just like you just feel uneasy like I I just as you were saying I just pictured Ted Bundy I'm like I know exactly what you mean yeah these are very charismatic individuals particularly you know if we're leaning into like the proper psychopath because psychopaths can be people who are not murdering people and they're not committing crimes they just have absolutely no capacity for empathy at all so that's where we're leaning you know mm-hmm. going on the the top of the spectrum so no capacity for empathy high traits of narcissism and then you're going to have more manipulative behavior because actually they're they're experiencing you know no feelings of guilt they're actually experiencing pleasure in your suffering so then the control actually elicits pleasure in them so there's an incentive for them to control you and there's an incentive for them to cause harm mm-hmm. And it gets sinister and that's where it's scary and your body is telling you flee. And that's where with those kind of narcissists, you're um, you're really getting your strong flight or flight. You're going to get a more minor flight or flight with um, people who are just highly judgmental. So the, the gaze of the narcissist where they're looking down on you is going to make you feel anxious as well. It's built in um, our systems because actually we need to feel a bit of social anxiety in order to fit in and survive. So actually when the narcissist is judging us negatively and looking down on us, that's where people will feel anxious because they're thinking, oh, I'm not, I don't feel good enough because they, they'll know that this person is actually judging them negatively. Um, so then that's where you'll also get a bit of anxiety when dating a narcissist, but they don't necessarily need to be a psychopath for you to feel that yeah and I just just for anyone at home I'm not saying that all psychopaths are murderers thank you for saying that like I just I was just like what psychopath do I know and I was like oh, that's Bundy. <laughs> good um, example so, yeah. <laughs> he was he was a womanizer yeah oh god fascinating like absolutely because you do see how charismatic he was and you see why women absolutely oh of course I'll come and help you t- t- take something to your car right and he managed to like persuade women to get in his Volkswagen you know, Beetle and say he was a cop. It's like, you know, and the story with the one person that actually survived, she said like, all the signs were going off. Something doesn't feel right, but he's so sweet and he's so lovely and he's got his arm in a cast, you know, so all these things that your generous, sweet, kind mind tells you overrides that notion that your gut is trying to scream at you. Absolutely. And also the attractive traits in narcissists. And this is where it gets really difficult for women. Narcissists are very authoritative and men who are authoritative, it's a very masculine trait and it's very attractive. Mm. So it's very attractive to women. When a man can be authoritative in a healthy way, that's fantastic. You've got a man who's confident. Narcissists are overly authoritative. So then that's where it's difficult to draw the line. So often women are going towards narcissists. And I think in this day and age, you know, some men are, are afraid to be authoritative because, you know, there's been a lot of things that have happened where, where actually it's, you know, it's hard for them to, to kind of necessarily feel confident to have that masculine trait of being authoritative. And um, so women are craving this authoritative figure. And then they find the narcissist and they're like, oh, finally a confident man who's not afraid to take the lead and be authoritative authoritative Mm -hmm. but it's the wrong type of authoritative because that's controlling so actually what women you know can be looking out for is the confident empathic authoritative man is you know highly desirable but women you know see the authority of of narcissists and and because it's quite a masculine trait it's highly attractive um and this is where this this charisma thing comes into narcissism Mm. wow i'd never thought about that almost like narcissists now have an i hate to say but like a bit of an easier time maybe because guys do seem to be getting a little less confident. And so to your point, when a narcissist comes along, you just see the confidence. So yeah, it's hard for men because I think there's a lot of messages that they pick up on where they yeah, feel afraid to be authoritative and women need authoritative men. It's, it's, you know, it's what women crave. And, um, and then that's the, that is probably the problem with why so many women end up with narcissists. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I find confidence very sexy, even yeah. in a woman, right? Like, oh yeah, she's got confidence, yeah. right? Like you're drawn to it. Yeah, exactly. So like, and this is the thing, it's like, You know, don't feel bad if you've been in a relationship with a narcissist. Don't feel bad if you've dated them. And actually, most people have dated narcissists. If they've been single for any period of time, they have dated narcissists. Because, you know, if we think about 
my earlier point of what is narcissism and why are we overusing this word? Well, actually, it's just low empathy and it's just uh, selfishness because of not having the best caregiving. And that unfortunately is a lot of people because there's no parenting manual and, mm -hmm. you know, parenting is really tough. And, you know, sadly, a lot of parents do not have the means or have not had the upbringing to do a fantastic job. So actually, there's a lot of people with low self-esteem um, who haven't really, you know, developed the levels of empathy that make them really good at being in a relationship. So there's loads of low empathy people out there. And that's that's why it's quite common for someone to have encountered some of these people along the line if they've been searching the dating pool. Yeah. Ooh. All right. Number nine, they want to be in control all the time. So going back to kind of dominating you. Yeah, they do want to be in control all the time. And, you know, again, it's like it's attractive in the beginning because you want a leader. You know, women find that great. They find it refreshing to be feminine and, oh, the man's not afraid to take the lead. Great. I take, I take a break. I don't have to make the decisions all of the time. So that dynamic can be a lovely male female dynamic in the beginning. Women can feel very, very submissive in a very comforting way. Um, so, it's, you know, it's not all bad in the beginning, but then that it doesn't become mutual. So actually it doesn't even out. We're actually, okay, you get to make some decisions some of the time. I make some decisions sometimes and you have this mutually loving, respectful relationship um, because actually the narcissist, because of their ego, will feel that they're the better one to make all the decisions. They're right and you're wrong after all. And, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore they have to be in control all the time. But what's interesting in this one is in a sexual relationship, so I'm just going to share, share my own story. I actually love my husband taking control in the bedroom. Like I actually love being submissive. Now, of course, I trust him. We've been together for 23 years. But if you are a person that actually likes that, the I'm just going to assume here, the guy to yeah. take control in the bedroom, where, how do you start to assess? Mm. Because if you like it in the bedroom and they want it in the bedroom, how do you know? Yeah. So again, just listen to your gut because all sorts of like dynamics can play out in the bedroom that, you know, if people know their own pleasure and they're really in tune with that, they know what they want in the bedroom. They're able to communicate that to mm. the partner, the partner who they trust, the partner who they know loves them, who they know cares about their feelings. So anything can happen in the bedroom. It doesn't mind, no matter how weird or wonderful it is. And, um, you know, and actually, you know, it can be that if you're a female, that relationship can be that um, that your man is always very dominant in the bedroom or maybe not, but actually it's safe because you're in a safe space. So you don't need to look at the dynamic in the bedroom, but what you do need to look at is how their behavior makes you feel. And that's where, you know, I, I know some women who've sadly fallen into BDSM relationships. So bondage, domination, sadomasochism. And that was normalized for a long time. There was like the whole Fifty Shades of Grey movement, which I was very worried about. I was worried for women because I was like, oh my God, this is some sinister men are going to take the opportunity to just have complete control and dominate. And then the woman's going to accept that because it's now being normalized. So um, some women fall into these um, dominant relationships and it's um, sold to them as being part of a kink. And then because it's part of a kink, it's like, oh, it's sexy. It's cool. I'm just experimenting. This is very interesting. And for some people, those relationships are fantastic and very healthy and very you know trusting, very safe. But actually, if you get into that kind of situation with a narcissist, it can be very damaging and very abusive and very dangerous because they are allowed to have all the control because you're deciding to be the submissive in that dynamic and they're the dominant one. So they can inflict pain, they can be abusive, and it's all guised as being, oh, it's just our kink. You know, this is what we do in the bedroom. Um, and I'm not saying that all relationships like that are bad or harmful because again, trust your instinct. It's really about listening to your emotions, but actually be careful if you're going into that kind of dynamic with a narcissist. So I think this is where, you know, it's, it's really important to be having conscious sex with anyone that you're having sex with, because then if you encounter a narcissist and you're being conscious about what do I want? What do I feel? What's happening in my body? What are my emotions telling me? Then if something doesn't feel right, you're going to be able to stop the situation and be like, hey, can we just have a chat about what just happened there? And that's really important, actually, when you're having sex with someone who is you know, a new partner, who's not making you feel great, who might have high traits of narcissism, is as soon as you feel something emotionally that doesn't um, feel great, just stop what you're doing mm -hmm. and say, hey, can we just take a step back? You know, when you did that, it actually felt a bit of a bit upsetting for me and just see how they respond. And 
going back to that, I'm just obsessed with what you just said about um, Fifty Shades. They really romanticized it as mm-hmm. well. They romanticized the pain and the dominance um, and that type of uh, um, connection. Yeah. And, you know, no one was really talking back then about, but what about, you know, ending up doing this with the wrong people? Oh, and yeah. it was so concerning. And I think I wish we could like just rewind to that place in time and be like, you know, look, you need to screen, you know, if you're, if you're going to, you know, get into that dynamic, amazing, but like you have to build trust first. You have to screen your partner. You have to have, you know, long conversations with them and you have to actually test out how will they respond to your emotions and also how will they manage, how will they deal with conflict? So it's better to, you know, spend enough time with them to, to see what goes, what happens when you have a disagreement, because then you're going to have an indicator as to what's going to happen in the bedroom. If mm. you don't, if you're not aligned on some of the interaction that that's happening. So no, don't sleep with a guy on the first date, just in case they're a narcissist. <laughs> Talk to them for six hours. Okay. Six hours. <laughs> yeah, like, like by all means, if you want to sleep with them on the, on the first date, sleep with them, but talk to them at length and ask them questions, ask them about their family, ask them about their passion. You know, just um, it's like you're going on a fishing trip. You don't know what you're looking to find, but you're looking for information. And at all times, just keep doing a body scan and particularly like what's your chest telling you? What's your stomach telling you? What are you feeling? And um, if you're feeling too excited, then, you know, maybe something is, you know, too good to be true. Um, or actually, if they're upset, if they've upset you a few times, then that's also an indicator that actually this prison might not be a safe prison. Oh, all right. Um, number 10, they will lie. Just flat out lie. I'm just going to lie. <laughs> um, well, yeah, it kind of feeds into all the other things, the gaslighting, the kind of delusions they tell themselves to protect their own ego. Um, they're right and you're wrong. I mean, it's all to do with control, their own, protecting their own ego. They, they can't accept that actually they might be wrong sometimes and sometimes their behavior really falls short, short and they're not good enough, triggers too much shame in them and that's not something that they can tolerate. Um, so and then another thing is that they're not gonna register enough guilt in order for, for them to feel bad enough about lying. And mm-hmm. this is where they'll cheat and cheating is more common if you're dating a narcissist. And the reason they're able to cheat is that actually... What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I want to teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. They might register a bit of guilt, but they'll dismiss it because they're very good at suppressing their emotions. Whereas a healthy individual will feel so guilty that they'll either stop the affair very soon after it started Um, or actually they'll tell you about it and, um, you know, they'll do something that will fix it because they don't want to keep feeling that guilt. But the narcissist is not able to regulate their emotions. They're very good at suppressing their emotions, often through substances or addictions or distracting themselves with work. They're just shoving down emotions all the time. So any guilt that's triggered, they're just pushing it away along with the idea that they're right and you're wrong. Um, So actually you'll probably find that actually in this dynamic you're being cheated on in some shape or form it's going to be a lot more common than in a different relationship that one this was a really hard one for me because in a lot that we've spoken about i think you can start to identify these traits by asking questions by you know feeling your gut and maybe you can um, go back to your gut to see if someone's lying but that's still sometimes like especially if you're a really good liar like you you like they looked me in the eye right like they they held my hand like all the things that you kind of perceive to be oh if they lie they're going to do this Mm. so this one's really hard for me to kind of i think through to identify in somebody um how do you advise maybe or is it just like a long enough timeline they'll start to show themselves just trust your instinct because if you're constantly thinking that your partner is lying to you there it's telling your body is saying i don't feel safe I don't trust this situation. They might not be lying to you about the exact thing that you're thinking they're lying about, but if you're constantly questioning, you know, are they, something's not adding up, are they lying? And that's on your mind all the time. Something is going on. 
and and you know and and this is where often people will end up having to do their own detective work and then you know they start you know checking phones and and kind of going into detective behavior which is awful because people will often go against their own morals when their mm. body is question is and you know their instinct is getting them to question things so much so if you're feeling you know that and it's it's a hard one because sometimes people are thinking, why am I why am I feeling so insecure? But you know, if you're just questioning your partner and you just can't trust them, and they're they're sh- they're giving you reasons not to trust them, you know, they're being secretive, they're they're you know not very open with their phone, things like this. You know, people are very good at being lie detectors if you trust your instinct. And I assume they're not always lying. There are times they would choose the lies that benefit them. Yeah, they they only lie when they need to lie and, you know, it's to protect themselves or to get what they want. It's not like they have to be pathological liars. No, they don't have to be pathological liars at all. And, you know, it really depends on actually what is happening in the relationship. And, you know, and also they may not cheat. You know, I'm not saying that all Mm -hmm. narcissists will cheat either because actually some of them will have, um, you know, ideas about about what's right or what's wrong and how they want their relationships to go. But there will be other trust issues and there'll be other ways that actually you're not being treated correctly, such as not caring about your emotions. So narcissists still have morals. Oh, they still have morals, <laughs> yeah. Unless they're psychopaths. Right. Um, oh, okay. Right. Yeah, they don't have morals, but actually, yes, they still have, you know, they still have influences. Um, you know, perhaps they grew up in a family where they watched how their mom and dad's relationship played out and they want to aspire to something that looks kind of like that because they perceive that as like being, you know, the gold standard or or something to uh, to go towards. So so they will still often have you know, ideas as to um, how they want to live their relationship life. Uh, they will sometimes very much believe in monogamy, for instance, based on their beliefs that they've established growing up. Mm, interesting. Fascinating. Um, number 11, they're not kind. Well, no, it's just, uh, after everything we've said, it's like, it doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> what can I say? Sadly, they're not kind. Um, the, the empathy is just, yeah, it's just not high enough. I'm not saying it's not there because actually perhaps they have the capacity for empathy, particularly when it doesn't involve their behavior and how their behavior has impacted you. But actually they're not very kind because they will put themselves first because they're selfish, because they haven't matured enough to be able to look at things from other people's perspectives. But I assume they can be kind when it benefits them as a manipulation tactic. Oh, they can be very kind when it benefits them. And they're people pleasers, which is why you often see that they won't tell you the truth. They will often not break up with people in a, you know, when they, when they should, or when they've lost interest in the relationship, um, they will often do extravagant things and they'll go and above and beyond to actually look like very good people. So sometimes they will host, you know, huge dinner parties and look after people and make sure everyone's catered for because they'll want to impress the right people Mm. in the right places. Um, so they'll be incredibly good and kind, kind acting to people who will benefit them and people where they'll get something in return. And then they won't be great to people that they perceive as being lower value who won't benefit them in in any way. I think a good example of this is let's just say the person has a membership for a private members club. And every time they go in there, they tip the waiting staff, they tell them jokes, they're kind to them because they know the next time they go in, they're going to get special treatment. And then they're in the cab driver, they're in the cab home Mm. and they're rude to the cab driver because they think they're never going to see them again. Oh, that's interesting. And then when even when you said people pleasing, I was like, well, a lot of us kind of people have people pleasing traits. But is the difference then if like I'm I used to be a people pleaser a lot, but it was because like I love my mum so much and I want her to be happy. And so like I feel really bad about telling her that I don't want children because I know it's going to break her heart versus a narcissist that's a people pleaser because of their own ego. Yeah, exactly. It's very much the ego boost for themselves. And also you know, the, the perception, you know, they need other people to perceive them as being this saint. So they kind of build this like false reality of who they are, you know, that their public figure, their, their way of being publicly is all about putting on a show. And the putting on a show means that they always want to look really good in front of other people. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the people pleasing you're talking about, you're absolutely right. It's more about, I don't want to hurt the other person's feeling and, and often people are struggling to tell the truth. Um, but actually, usually those people have enough empathy to look back and do the right thing in the end. Yeah, because as I was thinking about how this relates to specifically sex as well, it's that I really want my partner to be happy in the bedroom. So I'm going to do this to make, obviously within your code of ethics, but to do this to make them happy because I know this will make them happy versus I'm going to do this so I feel like a stud. 
yeah, it's confusing, right? Because mm-hmm. like you might see the very same behavior, but then the motive behind the behavior right. is what we're looking for. And that's where it's like the after behaviors and the aftercare in sex is is what's important um so it's confusing and you know um, sex is highly addictive it you know really brings uh, brings about a lot of physical stuff that makes us very likely to go back to sex when it feels very good so actually people need to really kind of you know take a step back when you've had a sexual encounter uh with someone and you know really think about how did you feel and how safe did you feel and how was the aftercare how was the person in the pillow talk afterwards (laughs) all right um number 12 they won't ever apologize they'll find it really hard to apologize and actually with this one they might say i'm sorry but do they really mean it? Are they just saying, I'm sorry, because they know they need to keep you happy so that they can keep the peace and stay in the relationship and have their needs continue to be met? Often they will never apologize at all because that would involve admitting that they were wrong. So actually apologies are very rare, but sometimes you will hear the words, I'm sorry. And what you need to look for there is, do they really mean it? How do you know then if they really mean it or not? Well, you have to look at well, what was the... Um, what was the context of this situation? You know, was it just them saying, I'm sorry, because they wanted to end the conversation? And also, what are they doing to bear, you know, your perspective mm. in mind for next time? So if they're saying, you know, they're sorry for like texting someone that they shouldn't, you know, creating some kind of emotional bond via, via text and they apologize and they say they'll never do it again. Um, you know, are they actually really going to never do it again? Do they really care about it? You know, are they really reflecting on the behavior or are they just saying, I'm sorry, so they get to stay in the relationship and it keeps the peace? Yeah. All right. And number 13, they won't connect emotionally. Yeah. So this is a confusing one because there's going to feel like there's strong emotions going on. Because uh, it's a roller coaster, there's a very intense phase of the idolization phase, and then there's the devaluing phase. But is it a true emotional connection? What you'll find is you're missing a lot of things that are important for people to connect. So you're going to be missing the conversations of wants and needs, and building a future together, and negotiating things, and um, being able to resolve conflict in a really healthy way. So the communication is not really going to be about really getting to know you as a person and sustaining that over a long period of time. And um, it, it's going to be more superficial. So you'll probably find that your partner, you feel quite lonely in the relationship because you feel that your partner probably has never really gotten to know you and who you really are and your wants and needs and um, actually having a dynamic that's a two-way a mutual dynamic. And would they... Um Typically, then, let's say you're, you're like pressing them a bit to try and be more emotionally open. Are they more likely to lie or are they more likely to shut down? So you probably feel you probably feel you're just not getting anywhere. Mm. And, um, you know, and this might be that you're trying to have a serious conversation and they distract you or you're just not getting the closeness that you need. So you might just constantly feel like you're craving more closeness um, or that the problems are always getting in the way of having the conversations about building your lifestyles in the way that you want to you want to build and like having these um, c- constructive conversations where actually, you know, you're actually, you know, solving the problems together or you're building a future together. It's, it's like too much drama gets in the way of that or things that are kind of superficial. Mm. So is there anything that you can maybe ask somebody, let's say, because everything we've covered is if you're already in that relationship, hoping that maybe someone isn't right now, but they're like, oh, I don't want that. I don't want anything that, you know, you guys have just broken down. Is there any like maybe like three questions or the questions you can ask um, somebody on a first day or on a second day that can start to identify whether they're going to be a toxic narcissist? So you could say, how do you handle conflict? How do you like to handle conflict? And just see what they say. And then you're just listening to your emotions. You're just being like, you know, you're listening to what is your body saying? Because they might just present you with a whole, you know, the ideal answer. Right. Because it's quite a, you know, it's quite a leading quite. Of course, everyone's on their best behavior on the first date. And um, you they most likely will tell you what you want to hear. But you just need to really pay attention to what how how is your body responding to that information. And then you go away from that first date and then you check in. Because it's too hard to check in emotionally when you're 
focused on the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can really ask them anything because you're just going on a fishing trip to find out who is this person. Um, you know, you don't want to come across like as you're interrogating them because first dates should be fun. You know, so just have loads of fun, throw in the odd question about their life, their preferences, what they want from a relationship. I think it's really a really important question is, are you looking for a long-term serious relationship? Um, because actually when people are, they're usually able to say yes to that question. When they're not, they will lie to you in all sorts of indirect ways, or they will basically tell you that they're not looking for a relationship in all sorts of ways. So they will say things like they'll skirt around the question. The question. They might be like, oh, what do you mean by a long-term serious relationship? Mm-hmm. Which is avoiding answering the question. Or, um, well, yeah, but like, you know, I just want to see how things go or, um, um, or, or yeah, well, yeah, eventually. And there will be just not a direct, yes, that's what I'm looking for. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, you, you want to, you know, make too many assumptions, but just take the information as being interesting information. If someone is saying on a first date that they're not looking for a long-term serious relationship, and that is what you're looking for, then already they've told you that, that you're not aligned and it's a mismatch. So then, Why would you continue dating them? Which is what a lot of women that I work with end up doing, that they find out someone's not looking for the same kind of commitment as them, and then they keep dating them. So ask very direct questions to see if you're aligned. Um, Of course, you might not be looking for a long-term serious relationship, and that's fine too. But, you know, just just ask them the questions that are as direct as possible so you get the information while also having loads of fun Mm. and not looking like you're interrogating them. Yeah. Um, Out of curiosity, why then if the women, if the person says... I'm not looking for a serious relationship, but the women are. Why do they keep dating them? Is that the hope that they're going to change or they're trusting like, or not even trusting, they're going through, um, they feel the heart flutter. And so they're following that instead of what the person actually just said. Yeah, desire. But actually they're just completely discarding the real, the reality of the situation or they're not actually good enough at detecting what is, what is the reality of the situation because actually in a lot of situations like this, if a woman is going to say, are you looking for a long-term serious relationship? They're not going to get a no. It's rare that a man is going to say no, because then they lose the opportunity and, and the woman's out the door. Um, so uh, in this situation, when you ask a direct question, then just listen very carefully to like how much padding is around, the mm-hmm. how much conditions are around that answer. So what women are tending to do is if the man is saying, oh, like eventually I would like that, then they listen to, oh, eventually I'd like that. Okay, he says yes. And they're turning it into a yes. So they're translating the information in a very different way. So you want to ask direct questions. You want to get direct answers at the appropriate time because you don't want to turn things too seriously. But but really take note of the answers that you're getting because anything that's a bit hazy or vague means you're probably going to get hazy and vague. Yeah. Um, Thank you for breaking that down. So now assuming that somebody is in a relationship, they've heard all the flags and they're like, okay, now I want to leave. Like, yes, everything you guys have said has really hit home and I really want to relieve this relationship. What are the steps you suggest somebody takes? This is really hard for people because if they're in a deep trauma bond, they have to get over an addiction. So actually they have to get over love addiction in order to get out of the relationship. Now, love addiction is basically being addicted to a feeling that is related to a romantic situation, but it's not love. It's not a deep, committed, trusting, safe relationship. So first of all, you need to identify that leaving them is going to be as difficult as overcoming an addiction. And therefore your tendency to want to go back, even if you successfully leave, your likelihood to be like, I just can't take this pain anymore. I can't take the pain of not being with them. I can't take this um, craving to go back. And and sometimes people then will fall straight back into it. So you have to recognize that, that if you've already fallen into a trauma bond, you're leaving a very serious addiction. And you have to acknowledge that in yourself. You don't have to call yourself an addict or anything. You just have to compare it to an addiction and you have to acknowledge that, okay, I'm in a deep trauma bond. This is going to be as difficult as overcoming an addiction. Therefore, I have to go absolute no contact. I have to do whatever it takes to go no contact. It can't just be that when I have the impulse to message them or call them, I can do it because this is like overcoming crack. You can't just dabble in crack occasionally if you're serious about overcoming crack. So you have to take it that serious if you're in a deep trauma bond with a narcissist. Oh, What if there's fear behind leaving? Fear is in what they may do. They may... Um, you know, what is the word? Um, 
uh, like try and sabotage you, sabotage your name, talk badly to you, mm. things like that. Yeah. And obviously different people have different situations. If kids are involved, it gets a lot more complicated. If there's domestic violence, it gets a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. So in the extreme cases, you definitely need to contact the right support and the right organizations who can advise on the legalities where there's children and, and really helping come up with a safety plan. But if you feel that they won't actually do anything too harmful and it's just words, then you have to trust that actually um, it's better for you to leave and you know, let them say whatever they want to say and you can just deal with it afterwards and that you will be healthier and happier once out of the dynamic, even if you lose a few friends um, over it, that you will be able to repair things and you'll be able to repair your life in a way that is much better than your current situation. So you can't control them. Um, you know, if they do something that's against the law, then that's where you may need to get, you know, some extra support. But, um, but you know, if it is really just... They may get very angry, let them get angry, just, you know, block them if you need to block them. So you're shielded from abusive messages that might come through or angry words, words that come through. Um, but get yourself out of the situation. Avoiding that conflict as much as humanly possible. Yeah. Yeah. Just to protect yourself. And, you know, and, and yeah, some people have very strong emotional reactions to being left because, as I said before, narcissists have fear of abandonment. And when that gets triggered, triggered, they're more likely to express anger because it's safer to, to them than expressing vulnerability. They might express vulnerability as well because, you know, sometimes they're on the floor begging and, you know, doing quite outrageous things to convince people to stay. Um, so expect the outrageous behavior because that person is terrified of being left, but you still need to leave someone who doesn't have enough empathy to offer you a decent relationship. Mm. And if you have the empathy and you see them on the floor, crestfallen, heartbroken, they're probably trying to pull at your heartstrings. You have to put your own oxygen mask yeah. on first. Yeah. And, you know, and that's the hard thing here is because often people who have a lot of empathy will care for others first. A lot of women will care for, other, for others first. It's deeply ingrained in them. It's a very maternal instinct that actually women just care for others before they care about themselves. They do that a lot in relationships. So if they're in a relationship with a narcissist, the tendency is to care for the narcissist first. And that has to stop. You have to just, even if it feels selfish, even if it makes you feel guilty, you have to look after yourself first if you've been mistreated. Homie, where can people find you and everything you're doing? This has been so freaking amazing, so tactical, so informative informative. Um, so where can people find you and all of the other work you're doing? People can find me over on Private Therapy Clinic, which is my YouTube channel. I'm also on other socials such as Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Becky Spellman. My homie, if you enjoyed this video, you're going to freaking love this next one. When they look at people's brains, when they're in a brand new, and it's called the infatuation stage, mm -hmm. can't get enough of each other. Your brain, the dopamine centers of your brain are firing like crazy, which is the same addiction center that gets you addicted to coke or anything else. Yeah, and so that's fascinating to me because it also makes me understand why people do stay in relationships probably longer yeah. than they should because yeah. they're trying to get it back. Back, yes. Um, and actually, I have a quote of yours about relationships and people being in them too long because I think the intoxication part of it and the chemistry part mm -hmm. of it and then the want of wanting to feel a certain yes. way, um, even when you don't get it, there's multiple things. There's one that you like, people say they're pot committed if you play poker, right? Yeah, yeah. Where it's like, well, I've spent six years with yeah, this person. Yeah, yeah. I can't just leave now. And I want to start over. I don't want to start over. And then you've got another quote of yours where it says, the pain of being in the relationship has to be greater than your fear of leaving Always. it. Always. Always. Or you're not going to leave. Nope. Dude, that was so strong. That's, it's so true. When you are staying in a relationship out of fear, which let's face it, 99% of those relationships that we really should be leaving, that we stay in, we're yeah. staying out of fear of consequences, financial fears, fear about the kids, fear there won't be anyone better, fear I won't find anyone better, fear I've lost too much time. I mean, name your poison, right? There are a million different fears. What has to happen in those cases from, you know, is either you address those fears, which let's face it, most of us don't do, mm -hmm. right? Or eventually, and it always gets there, eventually the pain of being in that stuck place becomes greater than those fears that are keeping you stuck. How many people waste their time though between that, like where they're kind of new. Yeah. And it becomes like you try, but 
those years that you're trying really like in fact how do you bypass spending those years yeah. where you get to the point where it's like all right now it's just too bad i have yeah. to leave versus yeah. like you, you just spend two years on something that you kind of knew from the get-go you know i'm i'm a big believer that in divine timing and i know there are often regrets when people finally leave and they're like mm. why the frick did i waste so much time right but once they get over that they do learn a lot of really important soul lessons from that time, right? So yeah, I would like everyone to get out when the getting's good and not wait too long. But here's the cool thing, and this is something I dis discovered basically with quantum love, is that I had always been, a, and still am a couples therapist, but like most couples therapists, I ideally had both partners in the room with me. And if one of them didn't want to come or wasn't ready to come, a lot of our work with the other one was getting that person in the door mm -hmm. or doing as much as I could indirectly since they wouldn't come in. What I have found with working with the energy and the feelings and moving yourself into the frequency of those intentions for your relationship is that I can actually help change the relationship with just one of you hmm. because when you change what's going on inside you, you have to be ready because everything around you will change. And what, and this is what happens when you start practicing this in a love relationship that isn't working for you. Either you're doing your work and you're raising your frequency and you're clearing the stuff that's in the way. The higher your frequency is, the better your life is gonna go. So anything from living primarily in curiosity, optimism, excitement, joy, um, forgiveness, those are all high frequency energies that are gonna create mm. much more. Shame, anger, fear, guilt and shame. Shame is the lowest, then guilt frequency, right? That's gonna create more of that. So that when you start working just individually and living in those higher frequencies, what I call home frequency, first, your life gets so much better in all aspects. In your relationship, your partner, and it's, it's amazing to me, in love relationships, we are, we are what they call quantum entangled. Our atoms are literally entangled. They've been able to show that couples' heart rates synchronize even when they aren't sleeping in the same bed. Hmm. And you know, there was a University of Washington study where they took a couple and when they shined a light in the eye of one, the ocular receptors in the brain of the other lit up. Like we're so, oh. we're so entwined that what happens is as you raise and hold a certain frequency, your partner literally entrains to you automatically. And so it's like a Jedi mind trick for your relationship. <laughs> it is crazy. And so often in our love relationships where our partner isn't showing up the way we want, the relationship will just naturally disintegrate. Mm. It will no longer feel so scary and painful because now you are living in a different place. You are stronger. You've done all this healing. So the fears that kept you in that relationship fall away. And now you're in choice in your relationship. And that is everything. Because if you're not in choice, you can't ever get your needs met. If, if you're not going to be okay and whole, not that you wouldn't be devastated if that relationship ended and maybe curl up in a ball for a while and be scared, but you know fundamentally you'll be okay and that your happiness and your peace and your joy and the ways you want to feel is sourced in your relationship with yourself. And anytime we're having a relationship with someone else, we really are only having a relationship with ourselves through that other person <laughs> anyway, right? When you recognize all of that and you can create your own happiness, right? I want to be with you. It's a choice. And if I can't get my needs met, I can leave. Ooh, that was so powerful. Okay, there's a couple of things that you just said that I really want to go into. Um, I'm a bit of a skeptic, mm -hmm. um, but everything you just said makes so much sense to me. And the reason why, and I, again, it's one of these, like I, I personally can't even explain it and, yeah. and you do such a great job. But like when you're around, um, let's say five of your friends and you're with each other all the time, yes. the fact that your, your hormones sync up and your yes. periods sync up, yes. like I wouldn't have believed it. Yes. And so understanding how you become on the same frequency as your partner, like actually you laid out so beautifully. And then there was another piece that I thought, oh, when you start stepping into that, I think you start acting differently as well, mm -hmm. right? So you start setting boundaries that maybe once upon a time you didn't. Absolutely. Any boundary you don't set is out of fear fear of consequences, fear of abandonment, fear of judgment. Mm. 
Um, and we're not even always conscious of those fears, right. right? But yeah, absolutely. Everything changes for the better. So whether whatever happens in the relationship, your whole life is going to get better. But here's, you know, I when I wrote this book, I wrote it with my husband in mind, who I jokingly call Senor Root Chakra, because he is so pragmatic <laughs> and such a skeptic. So like I have a whole chapter in there that is just laying out the science. But, you know, and I don't mind skeptics. I was a skeptic before I really understood this, too. But here's the fundamental truth that we know for a fact. We are taking in 40 billion bits of information into our brains every millisecond. But we are only consciously processing, consciously processing 2,000 bits. Wow. of the 40 billion bits wow. of information we're taking in. So we just then taking in the things that are familiar to us? Well, the or way our conscious brain works, it's called an envelope mechanism. We can only understand things and make sense of things based on our memories. Right. So, so that's all we can process consciously. Right. And we can also, we're also limited by our five senses, right? But there's a whole universe happening around us that, and in us and between us that we have no clue about because we're limited by our conscious minds and our five senses. Yeah, wow, that's so true, I love that. The, I mean, it's funny how you like, we're limited by it, you're right. Um, and isn't it though, I think women have like a, a, is it a fourth or a fifth a color receptor that most men don't? And we also have more connection between our left and right hemispheres. We have a lot of interaction there. So that's why women can be multitasking, we are a lot more intuitive. Uh, we are more capable of those more psychic sixth sense mm -hmm. understandings than many men are. Not that men aren't, but we just have that natural ability. All right. So let's talk about the difference between genders. I know it's, it's a little of a bit of a muddly situation yes. discussion right now, but um, I really want to talk about it because I do think there's a fundamental difference between um, at least me and my husband. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say that me and my husband, there's a massive fundamental difference between us. And the thing that we say a lot, and I've heard you say, and I'd really love to just have a really beautiful, honest conversation about it. Women want to feel loved to have sex. Men want sex to feel loved. Yes. It is one of the most controversial things me and my husband have ever spoken about. Um, and so I'd love for you to talk about that. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. And I don't, you know, it's partly in their, in men's DNA and how they evolved you know, during caveman times and, and the desire to spread your seed and all of those, you know, DNA type impulses, right? It's also because of the way they've been socialized and everything else. So for women, women, uh, we feel clo emotional closeness, emotional intimacy through sharing, connecting, spending time together, you know, for some of us cuddling, you know, physical affection, right? But men achieve that same sense of emotional closeness primarily their primary vehicle is through the physical act of sex mm. so what happens is and this is what the na i you know i did national research years ago on what the most sexually satisfied women have in common Ooh. and the cool part and interesting part to me is that it wasn't how many orgasms they had or anything else about the technique of the partner it was the emotional closeness they felt to the person they just had sex with that most predicted for their sexual satisfaction above and beyond anything mm. else. And it is also the thing that inspires women, especially in a long-term relationship after you get through that infatuation stage, right? When you move into what scientists call the attachment phase, um, your desire to be sexual, the myth is that it comes from spontaneous horniness like it did in the beginning of the relationship. Most women in a long-term relationship, for many different reasons we can get into, don't have a ton, they do have it, but they don't have a ton of spontaneous horniness. They are inspired and they don't, they don't know to access this, but they are inspired to be sexual from a feeling of I'm close with, I wanna connect with you, I love you, I feel connected to you, I wanna, show you my love in a way that lands. I want to even merge closer to you. I want to feel held by you. I want you inside, you know, whatever that is. But it's coming from an, a sense of connection mm. at its core. And so what happens is once a woman loses interest in sex because she's not spontaneously horny, 
and she's busy and she's distracted and she just doesn't have that natural impulse to be sexual and that's not what makes her feel connected to her partner anyway, she's less available for sex. And then he, because he's not having sex with her, doesn't feel that emotional connection and closeness. So he unconsciously, it's not like he's intending to punish her. He unconsciously pulls back. He's less likely to be romantic and send those sweet texts and cuddle and reach out to her in those emotional ways that make her feel close to him. And then because she doesn't feel close to him, she's that much less inspired to be sexual with him. So that's the sex romance stalemate, yeah. right? She's not having sex with him. He's less romantic and connected. He's less romantic and connected. She doesn't want to have sex with him and so on and so forth. You just explained it so perfectly <laughs> because that's the thing. It's like, um, w we had an interview, it was with Sting and he would, yeah. someone said like, what's, what's the, the magic to your relationship? And he said something like, well, I have sex for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. Now what he actually meant, and then that rumor went around, mm -hmm. oh my God, he does this tantric mm -hmm. sex for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. He's like, guys, I don't actually have sex for 12 hours, but my sex with my wife, starts in the morning when yes. I kiss her yes. good morning. It's when I tell her at 10 a.m. that she looks beautiful. Yes. It's at 11 when I make her a hot tea. You know, he's like, that's what the sex is for my yes. wife. She needs the 12 hours so that we can get to the last, you know, 30 minutes or yes. whatever. That's what I always say. Men, women are like a slow burning stove. Men are like a microwave oven, you <laughs> yeah. know? And so you got to stoke the flames mm. all the time so that she's feeling that connection and foreplay. I mean, that's, there was a, several studies done, I, which does, makes total sense to me, that men who do housework in a, real, you know, in a couple get significantly more sex than men who don't. And that's really for two reasons. First, because he's taking stuff off her plate that she gets too stressed about and then doesn't want to have sex because mm. she's got to clean. But also, more importantly, that's a form of love because mm. he's showing her that he's invested in the nest and he wants to help and he's taking things off her plate and she feels cared for and seen and partnered with and allied with and close to him and then wants to have sex with him. Ooh, that's so beautiful because it's beautiful to the way you've broken it down because you know, we've really spoken in this interview, it's like when you first meet someone, what are the, the, the tips and the, the how do we set each other up for success in order to have a long-term relationship? And then I think about long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, I would see couples that had been married for a long time. And I would hear women that would say, he's not romantic, you know, basically would spend an hour moaning and mm -hmm. complaining about mm -hmm. what their partner isn't doing. And then in that same breath, they're like, yeah, and it's his birthday today, so I've got to give it up. And like, as a kid, I remember, not as a kid, but yeah. I mean, no, as a kid, I remember thinking like, that feels counterintuitive. Yeah. It's saying that you want something from them, but yet at the same time, you're passing judgment on what they want. Yes. And so that never sat well with me. And then as I got older and I started to do these interviews and talking with you, it's like, there's a big gap between like, how when you first meet someone, there's this immense infatuation. And like you were saying at the beginning, right, yeah. the butterflies, yeah. and oh my God, this was meant to be, I've yes. known them my whole life. And then you flash forward 10, 15 years and you end up in this situation. Yes. Um, and where along the lines are those traps in relationships that we fall into? And so you, the way that you broke it down is beautiful because I used to hear women judge men. Yeah or their partners on wanting to be intimate. Yeah, and that hurt, that breaks my heart because mm -hmm. I try to explain to women that he is, he's not trying to punish you. You know, she'll say to him, why aren't you romantic anymore? Well, you know, if he's at all aware, he might say, well, we haven't had sex in six months or yeah. three months. And then she says, oh, you're only gonna be nice to me if I have, she doesn't understand that her not being sexually available for a man who has a healthy libido is like him being unwilling to ask you about your day or hold your hand. Oh! Like that's what it feels like. The, the level of rejection and disconnect. And, and it's big, it's really big. And I don't think women, and, and the other thing that I think puts us in this position as women is that most of us were never allowed by society or our families or encouraged to develop our own relationship with our sexuality. Mm. So sex from the very beginning was transactional, which it's not supposed to be. So sex was a way to get the guy, a way to keep them, a way to get a ring on it, a way to have a baby, a way to 
keep them from going over there, away, 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 a way to get them to be nice to me, the honey do list, right? Like he'll do the honey do list once I have, you know, it's a transaction, mm. but they don't have their own relationship with their own bodies and their own sexuality for its own sake, which men do, which is why they need it and want it. And also all those other DNA reasons, but, but women don't. So a lot of the healing that needs to happen with, I find with women stuck in this sex romance stalemate you know, is obviously there's the medical things, hormones, medications, things that inhibit your response and your mm. libido that I never want to ignore and relationship dynamics. But a huge part of it is your own relationship with your sexuality for its own sake. Because once you have that, then there's much more mm. connection, right? This I remember this rabbi telling this joke that if you put a jelly bean in a jar for every time you have sex before you get married and you take one out for every time you have sex after you get married, you're gonna end up with a big jar of jelly beans at the end, <laughs> right? And the reason for that is- Oh, this heartbreak. That's why men complain. Once, we, once you put a ring on a dude, you won't get laid ever. The reason for that is because you have married someone, like 99% of women in this country, who, for whom sex is unconsciously transactional. Oh, wow, God, that really hit me hard. Like, because I hear you like a currency, right? You're kind of yeah. using it as a way to get what you want. Yes. And so are you saying by examining yourself, by examining like what you actually like, it now no longer becomes a, well, what am I going to get from it? It's just like, this freaking feels this amazing. Feels amazing. <laughs> this, is, this is the most sacred, amazing gift that we are given our sexuality. There's, there, and the connection that that creates in your relationship is indescribable and irreplaceable. And, but even separate from your relationship, the relationship it gives you with your body, what it does to your body, the health benefits of it. And by the way, it's the highest frequency experience. It's major mass manifesting energy. Mm -hmm. It's that bliss, orgasm is that bliss energy that most of us don't spend a lot of time in unless we're Dalai Lama up on a mountaintop, right? So that's an opportunity to really experience physical bliss. So how do you start to unwind that past? Because to your point, I mean, I was told the same. It's like, yeah. it wasn't that it was bad or I was gonna, you know, go to hell. Like, it was never that intense. Well, I know some people do yes, have yes. hear that. Um, but for me, it was just, it was never discussed. It right. was never um, a topic. It was never encouraged. Right, um, which is a message in itself. Yeah. Silence is a message. Right. So how do you now, assuming that most people listening are hopefully adults, um, how would you suggest someone that is like listening to start exploring their body to start? Because yeah. to your point, I think you said, is it 30% of couples end up with bed, uh, bed death? Yeah, more than that. I would say that um, there there is a stat that at least 40% of couples ha ha by their, I mean, this is just the couples that report it, have sexless marriages. Yeah. Um, and even those relationships where women are having sex, they often aren't that into it. They're doing it just to kind of mm -hmm. maintain mm -hmm. things. They're kind of either faking orgasms. So, you know, I, I can't tell you how many men have told me that she's like, I've even heard stories where men have told me and their partner sitting right there and she admits it, you know, that she says, wake me up when it's over or don't leave me in the wet spot or just like get it over with. Oh. So it's like this physical release that he just needs to do and you know, that's it. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's because she's not, she doesn't have her own relationship with herself. So the way I think, I think every woman, um, and I gave you a little toy before. So yeah, you did. It. Honestly, come on now. Don't guys, do I not have the best freaking job ever? She comes with <laughs> sex toys. This is like literally the best job but ever. That's the thing you have to practice. You have to really get into the experience through self-stimulation and self-reverence and self-exploration of really claiming your own sexual experience mm. for, by, and with yourself. And what happens for a lot of women is that they learn a lot during that time about how they like to be touched and don't like to be touched and what feels good and what doesn't feel good and whatever else. But for many women who may already know that, but still have had this transactional connection, mm. which I would say is almost all women, um, they going through the process of really having sex with yourself mm -hmm. in a loving, reverent way for no purpose other than pleasure and self-connection. It, it's like a, a, a skill set and a, and, a, and a capacity that is inside all of us that just needs to be awakened. I a thousand percent agree. 
is there like that first there's someone that already that sees it as shame or sees yeah. it as like oh, i wouldn't do that or you know almost like dismisses it because yeah. what you're saying is so freaking powerful that i'm thinking about the person that doesn't quite believe it yet or yeah. wants to really wants to but it has so many years tied up of um you shouldn't don't you, touch yourself yeah right? well i mean first of all if you don't love your genitals how can you expect anyone else to hmm. like seriously i'm telling you Self-stimulation is the key to your pleasure, it's the key to your power, it's the key to your sexual power, it's the key to your ability to get aroused, and it's the key to your libido. Because first of all, where attention goes, energy flows. And if you don't use it, you lose it. You really do. Physically, you gotta keep the plumbing clean. You gotta keep the blood flow going. So if you're, you know, even if you aren't having sex with your partner for some reason, if you can continually self-stimulate, you are, it's so good for your health. It's so good for your immune system, for your blood pressure, for depression, for migraines, for your immune system. And there's so many benefits to sexual pleasure with a partner or without. That was like the best ad for masturbation. <laughs> and thank you for saying that. And the reason why I really want to talk about this, like I used to be the one, I wouldn't even say the word sex. That's how bashful <laughs> I was. So I need people to yeah. know that who they see today and being able to talk about it has because I've gone through my own yes. evolution. And I was the one that was told it's for the guy, right? So right. when the, my first boyfriend who I you know, lost my virginity to, it was for him. So yes. I didn't freaking enjoy it at all until I met my husband. Right. And it was because I felt safe. He encouraged me. He um, he was patient. He was patient. He welcomed it. He and so like all these things, I didn't feel the pressure. I felt mm -hmm. like the the idea and the notion of I'd be judged for it. He kind of like really did help break that down, um, and then just in that evolution allowed us to be a very honest with each other. And I yes. think that that's a big part. You actually said the mismatched libidos. How many people don't even talk about no, the fact that they're mismatched? No, they don't talk about it. And then he, you know, the one with the higher libido, men often, especially nowadays, are struggling with low libido. I think about one in five men have low libido, mm -hmm. but it's usually the female. And, you know, if you think about it, our bodies still haven't caught up, evolved with modern technology. Mm. You know, our bodies haven't, we're not supposed to live past our reproductive years. Several hundred years ago, that's what we died, you know, 50 was like the equivalent of 85 mm -hmm. today, right? So to live half of our lives beyond our hormonal ideal, right? A woman in her, who's in her 20s has twice the testosterone that a woman in her 60s has, that hormone of desire and sexual response. So it's slowly declining and we're living such a long time so that the, the, even the physiologic underpinnings of a healthy libido starts to disintegrate as we get older. And so, I mean, that's a whole other conversation about hormone therapy that I'm, you know, I'm a, like I say, I'm not an MD, but, but the thing to remember is that when we're young, for many of us, sex is easy. When we're in a new relationship, for many of us, sex is easy. It's about sourcing your sexual desire from your own relationship with your sexuality and expressing that and from a desire to express closeness, connection, and love with your partner. And what I hear from women all the time who have low libido is like, yeah, I would rather be watching Bridgerton. I'd rather be doing more things on my to-do list. Mm -hmm. But once I do it, I think, hey, this was fun. I should do this more often, but I just don't, right? So what is that then? That little thing that so once it's kind of like going to a party. We like, I really yeah. can't be bothered to go, and then you go and you actually have fun, right? right. But the Same next time thing. you really don't want to get dressed again to yes. go to the party, yes, or go to the gym, right? But but it's a habit and it's a practice, okay. And it's also mm. about the rewards it reaps, mm. and then it kind of sex begets more sex. I find that once couples start. And, and, and it often, you know, I'm a huge fan, even though it doesn't match the Hollywood movie uh, depiction of, of sexual relationships, I am a huge fan of scheduling sex, huge. Because it takes all the guesswork out, you know, because what happens when you're not having sex is the one that still wants it is scared to kiss or cuddle <laughs> you because you might think they're trying to start something and they don't want to be rejected or you won't reach out to them. Like there's all, the, there's an 800 pound gorilla in the room with you, right? So if you know that on Saturday, you know, it can be different times every week or the same, every couple's different, that's when we're gonna have sex. 
then there's all this openness and, and freedom to connect and to play and to be affectionate and to stoke that stove, right? And then you know you're prepared for it. And, I love that so much. And then you're ready and you have sex. And then you're like, hey, this was fun. And then it creates less guesswork. The 800 pound gorilla can leave the room. And then there's so much more freedom. And the other thing I like couples to do in between their sex dates is to make sure that they spend, you know, at least an hour, it can be split up a week, kissing, cuddling, no sex, kissing, cuddling, talking without technology and not about the logistics of their lives. Mm. And most couples don't talk more than, they talk maximum 15 minutes a week about things other than the logistics of their lives. And that's, you know, they'll talk a lot about the logistics, but 15 minutes max. And they're not spending time together because they're sitting next to each other with their technology. So, and they're not kissing and cuddling and being affectionate because one of them doesn't want sex and it's all mm. awkward. So once you kind of create this, what I find happens, especially because women, including those women with low desire, they really miss that non-sexual physical affection. They love making out, they love cuddling, but they won't initiate it because they don't want him to get too excited because they don't want to have sex. But once sex is off the table, except that time, then there's all this freedom to get all into it and have fun. And boy, is your stove stoked. God, it's so true. Everything you just said, I was like, oh my God, it's the things that we don't really talk about. It's the things that we kind of ignore. Mm -hmm. um, me and my husband, absolutely, we don't call it like a sex date, but we we absolutely schedule dates. And mm -hmm. that's the only time that we can both switch off. Mm -hmm. And then of 99.999% of the time, it ends in sex. So we do know that. And then we've started to as well... Um, spend the morning of our date getting ready yes. for sex. Yes. So it's kind of like, sometimes, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll trim his like chest hair. Yeah, or you'll you know. shave your oh, legs. Yeah, yes. and so, but we do it together. Yeah. And he'll even come and just keep me company if I'm shaving my legs. Aww. Because now it feels like we're actually spending it's time together. And it's foreplay, yeah. And then the other thing that me and my husband do, we have a rule. Um, I'll never, ever, ever make him feel guilty for asking for sex. Good. And he can never, ever, ever make me feel guilty for saying no. Good. And those are just like, and it, it became like this beautiful, like, ah. Oh, yeah, that's the way so much lifted. pressure off. Because to your point where the woman's like, I just want to cuddle, but I'm so freaking scared that if I cuddle him, he's going to want, he's going to be turned on. Yeah, yeah. And then you have to be able, and with the sex dates, it also has to be okay to say no. Like, let's say you're really not feeling well, or but you really don't want, like, that's the last mm. resort. And if you do say no on a sex date, you are responsible for rescheduling it as quickly as possible you know you don't wait another week and you and you get it in there because at a bare minimum what i want to see healthy couples is at least once a week and ideally never going more than a few weeks with that deep physical connection yeah click here right now to learn the seven ways to spot manipulation and gaslighting when we are truly dealing with a manipulation strategy is that we tend to get gaslit into believing that what we're saying happened didn't happen. And all of a sudden, you go from being on cloud nine